Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wayne Theater. We're excited that you're here for our signature speaker series for history. Thank you so much for joining us. A couple of things upcoming at the Wayne Theater tomorrow. We will be showing a classic film, The Seventh Seal, at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m., a pay-what-you-will event. But if you're coming to the 7 p.m. show, we encourage you to come early because from 5 to 7, we will have our art exhibit gallery opening with the artist Karen Rosasco. And since you're here today, if you'd like after the um, speaker series today, you're welcome to take a peek upstairs. You can access the exhibit gallery at the end of the hall by the stairs or past the restrooms using the elevator. It's on the second floor. It's realism meets abstraction, and we're very excited to have artwork on our halls for the first time in a year. So it's very exciting. Please. Mark your calendar for next weekend. Friday and Saturday night is the Marvelous Wonderette, sponsored by West Hills Realty. And we are so excited to be bringing another musical live to this stage. But we also will be offering a virtual option. So you can check that out on our website. And please come and enjoy. We also have other virtual options available. Our Daddy Long Legs musical that we held in October is now available. And so lots of things here at the Wayne, and we thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to pass it on to our wonderful speakers today, Nancy Sorrells and Richard Adams. What's it a name? Signature speakers. There signature, you go. signature speakers, right. I'm going to put that on my resume. Another, just another. <laughs> so Nancy, uh, to, 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 to today, let's, let's start with the, uh, the strange names of towns in the Shenandoah Valley. Yeah. So raise your hand, and we'll call on you. It's not pronounced anything like it looks like. Go ahead. Anyone have a... a Any, anybody here? What's the strangest pronunciation? Stanton. There, Stanton. Goes. there you go. There. Number one on the list. Any yeah. more? So Stanton, anyone know about Stanton? You know, that's how we tell, of course, the, the visitors from, from the natives. And, um, and there's a funny story about that that, that will get us to today's... today's um, actual talk, but Stanton is actually, we say it like the namesake said it, um, Lady Rebecca Stanton, and, and it was named Stanton, because Stanton was originally Beverly's Mill Place, you probably know that, but um, very quickly after it became Beverly's, Beverly's Mill Place, um, so many uh, what we call Scotch-Irish settlers uh, uh, from the north of Ireland who came into Pennsylvania and then moved into the valley came down here as a result of Lady Rebecca Stanton's husband, Governor Gooch, who relaxed the religious toleration laws in the valley, and as a result, all those Scotch-Irish settlers came down here because it was cheap land, um, and they were allowed to build their, their Presbyterian houses of worship. They couldn't call them churches because there was only one church in Virginia before the Revolution. That was the Anglican Church. Um, and but they were allowed to build their houses of worship and buy cheap land, and so they came flooding in, and they were so grateful that they named Stanton after the governor's wife, and she, Stanton is how it's pronounced there. And if you think about it, a lot of you say the word aunt, like, like my aunt Sandy, uh, A-U-N-T. Now, some people do say aunt, but A-U-N-T, and if you put an S-T on front of it, that's Stanton, so, so it's, it's an okay pronunciation. What are some other ones? Anybody else? Yes. Oh, that sounds like a riding thing, you know, because you had to jerk the reins tight to keep control of the, the mule or the horse you're riding, but I, I don't know. Um, we, we limit ourselves to just, you know, kind of in the upper valley here, but how about, how about one in the northern part of the valley, Weir's Cave? Nobody knows how to say that right. Um, or, or which is the which is the it's now what cave? Well, it's Weir's cave. Yeah, but what's it really now? It's Grand Caverns. Well, Grand Caverns is Grotto's. It's just down the yeah, down but, the road. But, but yeah. Weir's cave was. But Grand Gra Caverns. Grotto's. I mean, Grand Caverns was originally called Weir's cave, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's a that's an easy one. Um, from the and Basic City was you know an independent city from Wayne you know on the other side of the river from Waynesboro. It was an industrial boom town, like one we're going to talk about today, which is Buena Vista. They, they both kind of were birthed about the same time. 
um, and it was an industrial boom town trying to, to have mills and, and factories and things using the South River. And basic is the, is the basic process of making steel. So. Dooms? That's a, that's a so, name. So that's a family the, name. So you could have the annual Doomsday Festival. Yeah, that was, yeah. Um, or, you know, you always feel gloomy if you live in Dooms. But, um, but it's, it's, the fam it's a family name, the Dooms family. In fact, Mr. Dooms was an officer at, the, at Planner's Bank when I was a kid. Um, so still Dooms around. I don't know if there are any Dooms left, but, or maybe they were doomed. I don't know. Mag How about the, the strangest one of all up in Rockingham County, McGackiesville? Yeah, and that's just, it's the, it's the McGackie family, and that's just, that's that uh, Scotch-Irish accent. That's how they said it, McGackie. If you go to, you know, the Ireland, if the, north, the northern part of Ireland, you know, they're speaking English there, but you wouldn't know it if you tried to talk to them. Then we've got our, then we've got our two. Any more? Yes. Um, uh, Cremora. Cremora is... A, is um, Cremora might be a family name. I'm not sure. We'll have to look up Cremora. Does anyone know that one? There's a Cremora mine road. Right. Well, there was, a, there was a huge manganese mine there. It was, it was the largest manganese mine in the world in World War II. Um, and it went out of it. And so if you go, if you follow that all the way back, you'll see some of the ruins of the mines up in there. It was a big, it was a giant strip mine. But it was the biggest in the world. But there were manganese mines, manganese and iron mines, again, <clears throat> going back to our Buena Vista, um, all along the, the foothills of the Blue Ridge. So, so there, were, there were probably six or eight manganese mines in Augusta County, Rockbridge. I have another question. Uh, yep. kind of manganese, is that the mineral that was found? Mm -hmm. There was a plant in a community outside of Lynchburg, I know we're getting a little bit far afield, called Rusis, that was either manganese or magnesium, I don't know. It's probably, mangan it's probably manganese. Manganese and iron kind of occur together. Okay. And, um, and so there were a lot of iron mines around here, too. Which leads us to rat fine. Yeah. Yeah, there's one more, one oh, yeah. more hand up there. Swope. Oh, that was Jacob Swope. He was, it was the Swope family. Um, I went, when I was um, in college, I, I did a, took a class up in Canada. We were, were up in the Canadian wilderness, and... Um, my friend, I, I was from Greenville, but my friend was from Swope, and, and we took the class, and the, the Canadians up there, they just couldn't get, they just thought that was the funniest thing, that, we, that she was from Swope, and they kept saying, how do you conjugate that? Is it sweep, swept, swope? Um, <laughs> but, interestingly enough, the Swope family, sometimes they spelled it with two O's, and sometimes they spelled it with one. Um, yeah. All right, so that kind of leads us into... Richard and I, tell, Richard, tell them how we got this, this program started, Footnotes in Valley History. I used to go bike riding with Nancy, and, and I would say, we'd be riding through Rafine, and she'd go, i go, how, why is this called Rafine? And, and 20 years later, you know, I said, let's, during a pandemic, I said, let's just Zoom this and start our own business. So, and then we got invited to come here for even a larger audience than our Zoom audience. So. Right, <laughs> right. So, um, and the first show we did was Rafine. Yeah, we, we said, hey, people are always wondering how we got the, the word rapine, and no one can spell it. Some people say rapine or rapine, but it is rapine. Um, at least that's how the locals say it. And so we, we're dealing with two things, like how something got its name, and then what kind of twist did we put on it here? And, um, and, and you'll find that out really for uh, Buena Vista uh, a lot, because nobody else in the world says Buena Vista. They, they say it like it's supposed to be said, bueno vista, but, uh, but, but let's start with Rafim, um, and you really have to kind of go to Steele's Tavern. Isn't, anybody know where Steele's Tavern is? It's right on, it's on Route 11. You go through it, it's right on the Rockbridge Augusta County line, um, and so, and so Steele's Tavern, it, it's an old, it's an old village. It goes back to the 1700s. Um, it was on the Great Wagon Road, which was basically what Route 11 was. It was the Great Wagon Road. And then it became the Valley Pike. It was a turnpike. Um, and Steele's Tavern is named for the Steele family who were there. Their, their progenitor was a, a guy who was in the Revolutionary War, and his, uh, he had a really bad head wound in the Revolutionary War. And, and um, 
uh, he got hit in the head with, a, I don't know if it was a mu rifle musket or, or something, but it broke a, a section of his skull out and they thought he was gonna die, and they, but they replaced the skull with a silver plate and, and he lived like another 50 years. Um, and, but apparently his skull is in the collections, I think at Washington and Lee, his little piece of the skull is kind of morbid. But anyway, Steele's Tavern also had another, has another name. Did anybody, this is a Deep Valley trivia, anyone know what the other name of Steele's Tavern is? There's actually, if you go to Steele's Tavern today, there's only like one. one I know piece. what it is. What is it? White's Truck Stop. No. Okay. But that's a good guess. <laughs> But, but actually, there's a business in down, downtown Steele's Tavern um, with this name. It's Midway Auto Parts because uh, and the old folks call Steele's Tavern Midway. And the reason is because it was, it was a, a stagecoach stop and a, and a toll booth halfway between Stanton and Lexington. So they just called it Midway. Um, so, but if you go to Midway, even today, you'll see this marker that's here on the left and it talks about these two famous inventors that that basically would have called themselves as Steele's Tavern residents. They lived in the in the suburbs of kind of, of, of Steele's Tavern. And I don't know to have two pretty famous inventors grow up within a stone's throw of each other, it must be in the water. Um, and the creek that goes through there is Marl Creek. That's the creek that goes actually starts right around McCormick's farm and, and, and goes down, if you go across to Steele's Tavern then plunges down into Vesuvius, then it hits the, hits the uh, South River, which is the South River that goes south, not the South River that goes north, that goes through Waynesboro. Um, that's a whole different show. That's a whole different show. <laughs> but that South River plays into um, the story of, of Buena Vista too, but Marl Creek um, it's called, marl is like, li it's kind of like a limestone and, um, and people would have uh, dug up marl. It's just little fossils from the bottom of the seafloor. People dug up marl and limestone and they'd grind them up and, and um, use, them for, use them for fertilizer. So um, actually, I guess it's very fertile for the brain because we've got two, as I said, so over here on the left, that's the, the home of, of um, Mr. Gibbs who, is the reason for the Rafine getting his name, which you'll find out. Um, but um, let's see, let's go to the next show. Next, hey, Nancy. Next slide. There we go. Yeah. Back that up one. No. Whoops. That's, oh, uh, okay. How do we go backwards? Well, I don't mind. know how to go backwards. It was to the right. Yeah, yeah. Arrow. Okay. Got it. Go back. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's to the right. Okay. Yeah. You said to the left. Oh, so let's do the to right. the right. Yeah. My left, your right. Yeah, you've been out of teaching school too long. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, well, I think they probably guessed that the historic yeah. marker was not a home. Yeah. So they, they just moved on past my error. All right. Okay. So the first inventor was a pretty biggie. It's Cyrus McCormick. And he, if you go to Cyrus McCormick's farm today, it's a little wayside area. It's a Virginia Tech experimental station. There's a little hiking trail there and the restored mill and blacksmith shop are there. But uh, the Rockbridge Augusta County line, just like it goes through the middle of Steele's Tavern, it goes through the middle of the farm. In fact, it goes through the middle of the house. Um, but for the record, since I live in Augusta County, I can uh, happily say that Cyrus McCormick tested the first mechanical grain reaper in Augusta County, not in Rockbridge County. And he did that in 1831 uh, there's a picture of Cyrus McCormick up here to your right. <laughs> um, that <clears throat> Cyrus McCormick tested that in 1831, and he, within a few years, he went out to Chicago and got stinking rich off of the the um, the Reaper International Harvester. Now is his company, and and um, but he always remembered re remembered um, the area and gave a lot of money back in, into the area, helped build. New Providence Presbyterian Church, Old Providence Presbyterian Church, I'm sorry. Um, and um, McCormick's, I don't know, anybody from Stanton remember the old McCormick's building that was the YMCA and was the library at one time? Um, that was called McCormick's because Cyrus McCormick dropped a bunch of money here. But anyway, okay, 
the next generation, so McCormick uh, tested his reaper in 1831. There was a two-year-old guy who maybe absorbed it, um, and, th and that guy's name was, he was born in 1829 in the Steele's Tavern suburbs, and his name was James Edward Allen Gibbs, and that's the guy that is most important. Uh, apparently he was um, quite the, had the engineering mechanical mind. He, he was a tinkerer, um, just like the McCormicks were. And um, he called himself an inventor. And he saw this newfangled sewing machine kind of thing and tried to figure out how it worked and thought that he could do something a little bit better. So the sewing machine was really invented by a lot of different people. And then, and then certain companies came together and put all those patents together and, and made machines that they marketed. So, you know, Elias Howe and, and Singer. Singer sewing machine, of course, was a big one. And they didn't necessarily invent all those things, but they put it together into a machine and then did a good job of marketing. So um, Gibbs came up with a sewing machine. His machine was a little different. Um, and he, he uh, most of the people were creating sewing machines that used two pieces of thread. And if you think about today's sewing machine that we use at home, um, you know, there's a bobbin and then there's the spool. And they come together to form a stitch that, that intertwines and makes a pretty good seam that you can't pull apart. Um, Gibbs thought that the chain stitch was the better way to go. And, um, and he, and it, so he only used one, one piece of thread. And um, let's see here. And so this is a chain stitch. It, it, the chain stitch would come apart and the thread would break, but he invented something called a looper that, that worked to create the loop that interlocked it so that it wouldn't, it wouldn't come apart. And um, in 1850s, he really, um, he won some patent battles and he, he went up to New England and, and worked with some people up there, had a big fight, some court cases. It got convoluted and complicated. Um, and he did this from his, he was born in, in the Steele's Tavern area, but he ended up going to, to Pocahontas County in what's now West Virginia. And that was his home base there for, for the 1850s and for all these fights. And he went up to New England and finally he, he uh, had one partner that kind of he fell out with and invested a lot of money and then lost it all. And it was a conv convoluted, interesting um, story um, that if you, if you ever want to read an interesting book on how inventions really happen, this is a whole book on the sewing machine. Um, and all the different inventors. But he goes up there, and by the 1850s, he's, um, he's hooked up with a, two guys um, named Wilcox, their last name. It was uh, James and Charles. It was father and son. And they, they were pretty good business people, and um, they, they had a machine called the, the Wilcox and Gibbs sewing machine. And um, by the middle of the 1850s, Gibbs was was doing pretty well. And, um, and he, he uh, was making, making a good bit of money. And, um, and then, this, then the Civil War comes along. Um, and um, he has to, he moves back to, to um, the Steele's Tavern area to be with his family there. Um, he, he joins the Civil War joins the cavalry uh, for about three weeks and gets pneumonia by sleeping on the ground and um, decided that, that fighting wasn't for him. And so he ended up having to, to uh, spend all his money that he'd accumulated to buy a, uh, a, a mine in the area in Rockbridge County that was making gunpowder. And he kind of got out of doing service by making gunpowder powder for the Confederacy. And, and that just sucked up. By the end of the Civil War, basically he was broke. The Confederate money had, had um, you know, inflated uh, beyond belief and he didn't have any money left and so he was a ruined man. And so after the war, he goes up to, up to uh, New York where, where his partner was, and actually, to, actually to Philadelphia, where his partner was trying to see if if the Wilcoxes, if there was anything left of his 
of his sewing machine business. Well, it turns out that the Wilcox uh, had protected his interests all through the war and kind of, it wouldn't have been good to, it wouldn't have been good to, to actually have a bank account in a, in a Confederate person's name. So they had kind of a, sort of a Swiss bank account in Philadelphia um, and shielded the money and, and the, the sewing machine business had just taken off during the war. You can imagine one of the things you had to make during the war was thousands and thousands of uniforms, right? So the sewing machine business had just taken off during the war. And um, so he found out that he was a rich man. And uh, he came back to, to um, Augusta County and, and Rockbridge County and, um, and settled in. And he decided that what he was going to do for the rest of his life was be the southern salesperson for his machine and be the southern representative. And, um, and also, he, he built himself a nice house. And so, so th these are some of his, he, he just went all over the South advertising and, and, and uh, that this machine was going to help the South rebuild. Um, and it was a labor-saving device. Um, the machine was small, it was like a laptop size. Um, and, uh, but it was still kind of pricey. It was $55, which is about $1,300 today. Can you imagine paying that much for a sewing machine? If you got it with a ma mahogany case, it was, it was uh, a 60 some dollars and it was close to $2,000 in today's money. So, so but it, it, I, they, thousands and thousands of these, these machines were sold all over the country. And Gibbs, by the, by the 1870s or 80s, he was making about $10,000 a year, which is big money. And, um, Here's one of his sponsors that he got uh, to endorse his product. General Robert E. Lee said, the Wilcox and Gibbs sewing machine reached here safely yesterday. This is when he was living in Lexington, so safely um, not being very far. But esteem for its inventor, its simple mechanism, and the experiences my daughters have in operating it makes it a great favorite in my family whose labors it lightens. And so, um, so he, he built this nice house that you see um, on your right and my left. Um, and he called it Rafine Hall. And he had a room in Rafine Hall for inventions. And he came up with a lot of, he, he invented a bicycle, Richard. If we're talking about bicycling, he invented a clutch-driven bicycle, which was apparently just really hard to ride. Um, um, so that didn't really take off too much. Could never get anybody interested in that. But you see a railroad here. What did take off when the South was rebuilding after the war, the railroad was the key to the economic revival. And the B&O Railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio, uh, what, that we were talking about. He's a, he's a railroad engineer. We've yeah. already had this talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, the B&O Railroad was coming through the valley. Um, it goes through Stanton and one of the big endorsers of the B&O Railroad was General Robert E. Lee. Um, and it was, it was to go from, from, uh, you know, from Baltimore, but then come it, through Stanton. It came through Stanton, and it was moving its way through. You know, you'd go through Mint Spring and Greenville and Spotswood and all the way to Lexington. It never really got any further than Lexington. Um, and it was, a, it was a big deal. And in fact, it was a pretty, it was one of the, the three railroads that came through the valley. Um, and it really died out in the years right before the World War II. And then its tracks were all pulled up during World War II and sold for scrap metal. But, you know, when it was coming through um, in, in the 1870s or so, um, they had every place they stopped, they would buy, they would buy land and create a depot. And uh, of course, if it comes to Greenville, the depot is going to be Greenville Depot. And if it comes through Spotswood, um, which is in southern Augusta County, almost at the Rockbridge line, um, it really put Spotswood on the map. It was going to be the Spotswood Depot. But they wanted to do a depot at, at uh, Rafine Hall, at, at Gibbs's place. And um, he said, sure, I'll sell you land. And um, I'll give you a good price for it. And because that was his land, he got to name the place. And he said, I wanted to call it Rafine. And I don't know if they said 
why he called it Rafine, or they just said okay. And he, he got lifetime rights on the railroad. Um, and the reason for Rafine is that word that you see up here, Rafis. And Rafis is an old Greek word. It's, 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 not, a, it's not a common word in, in Greece now, but, but, um, but it means to sow. And it's, and it's in honor of his invention. And that's why he called his home Rafine Hall and why he named his little village. And by this time, because he had so much money, he had already, a little community had popped up around his, his home. When the railroad came in, he ended up building a creamery there where you could, you could ship dairy products on the railroad. He built a little factory. Uh, you know, he, he subsidized the little village that, that still is there today. In fact, uh, it's, a, it's still a post office. A lot of these little villages, post offices have closed down, but Rafine still exists, and so does Steel Stavern. So that's how Rafine got its name. Um, and I confirmed that, interestingly enough, when I was in college, my roommate uh, was from Greece. Uh, her name was Fotini Bezerinides, and her husband, his future husband, was from Greece as well. And I asked him one time, I said, is Rafis really a Greek word? And he said, yes, it's, a, it's an old word. Nobody uses it anymore. Um, it's an archaic word, but he said it means to sew or, or needle and thread. So there you go. That's how Rafine got his name, and you are now going to be the most popular person at a party sometime where people are throwing around trivial facts that nobody knows. And if you, and if you stop at the uh, Rafine once a month, they have barbecue chicken at the fire department. It's the best barbecue chicken in the Shenandoah Valley. It's pretty good. So, so, and, so take that to the party. Yeah, the volunteer fire department, they have a little, uh, you know, a chicken barbecue area that they've built out there with cinder blocks. And if you can go to the Rafine, they do a car... A, Carnival and a parade in the summertime, and uh, it's all fundraising for the fire department. And it's about, it's, what is it, about uh, three quarters of a mile off the interstate, maybe? Who has not been to Rafine? Okay, well, all you have to do is get off the Rafine exit and turn right. And go straight. And it's less than three quarters of a mile. Yeah. You'll, be, you'll be in the village. Don't blink, because soon you'll be out of the village. Um, don't and, spit or you'll flood it. Yeah, there's, um, let's see, there is um, the fire department, the post office, the bank, and I don't know that you could do any other shopping in, in the village proper, but between the exit and that, you have, you know, you have the, the White's truck stop if you turn left, but then you have uh, several gas stations, you've got a Wendy's restaurant, and um, so, and then, if you turn left at the exit, not very far, you'll come to McCormick's Farm, but in between McCormick's Farm and the interstate exit is Fuel City, where they also have, uh, they call, they say it's the best barbecue in the world. So, yeah. Um, go there and tell them that. So, and, okay, well, there you go. Um, Richard said he's, one day he's going to write a barbecue book and, and all the different types of barbecue that there are. He's going to start a fight. Yeah. There's the mustard-based barbecue, right, Richard? And there's the vinegar-based and the... Mustard is the hot sauce. Yeah. See, I told, I told you to start a fight. Yep, there you go. Get a but South it, Carolina anyway, guy Anyway, now, I, I mean, the, the Rafine, greater Rafine area now has a, a doctor's office. It's Dr. Marsh. It has a pharmacy, it has uh, Bojangles, it has uh, the Iron Skillet restaurant, so it's, it's a hopping place now, if you, if you head up there. Can I add one thing about Rafine? Please? Sure. That you've touched on here. If you go into Rafine on the road off of 81, if you look to the south, to your left, you can see a cut where the DNR Railroad once went through. If you look to the north, you can see a field where it went across the field. They're telling us Right, and, and it's actually, there's a, the old B&O um, road goes, for, if you go off the interstate and turn right, before you get to the village, you'll see the old B&O road that goes, if you follow that back, that'll take you to Spotswood. And if you're on 81, of course, at the Mint Spring, right before you get to the Mint Spring exit, you'll see the big stone bridge that was part of the B&O. Um, and then if you go down Route 11, if you look closely, Around Folly Mills and that area, you look closely, you'll see you'll see some of the the old um, you know the remains of the railroad. And then right before you get into Greenville, if 
you look off in the field, you'll see another big stone bridge. And at the pilot truck stop, the, the truckers actually, where, from where they park, and then they walk to the truck stop proper to get their showers. They're going over the old, another old railroad bridge. So, so the evidence is still oh, still there for for um, the old B and O. Uh, yeah, Virginia uh, Tech. Um, I don't know when they bought it, but it be, they bought it as a experimental farm. Um, if you get, they've got a little website. It probably tells you there. They bought the, the McCormick's house and everything, and it's been decades and decades since they did that. So they're responsible for keeping up the uh, McCormick's house now. They they are. In fact, their offices are there, and um, they. Uh, the director of, of that farm would like to do a lot more with, he's been talking to another historian, Ken Coons, who lives in Spotswood and I, about doing a little more research on the, um, and redoing the interpretive signage for the McCormick's farm, the blacksmith shop, which is where the reaper was actually invented. They've, they've restored the mill. The mill actually works again. And once the pandemic's over, you can go, they, they have old mill days in the fall there. There's a nice, um, it's about a half a mile nature trail that goes up through there. That's my husband and I take our dogs and go walk in there a lot. It's, it's, it's a nice little, it's a nice little trail. Um, so and you can picnic there. It doesn't cost anything. You can picnic there. Um, so I would recommend going to one of the places. We won't argue which one, and, and get a little picnic lunch, and then go to McCormick's Farm and sit at the sit at the picnic table and have a nice lunch there. What did you say McCormick's enterprise evolved into? International Harvester. International Harvester. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, are we ready to go to Buena Vista? C. <laughs> the next part of the story. Um, okay, so here's a funny story. Many years ago, I was, my husband and I were out, um, out west, and we went to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, this is probably in the early 2000s. And I wanted to send a postcard to my father in Stanton. And so at the north rim of the Grand Canyon, the Park Service runs a little post office right there. You have a little a volunteer who's in a Park Service uniform, and they run the post office, and they'll hand stamp it with Grand Cavern. I mean, Grand Cavern, Grand <laughs> Grand Canyon on it. So I addressed a postcard to my father in Stanton, Virginia, stood in line, got the little Park Service volunteer, uh, gray-haired guy was um, stamping them, and he gets to it and he says, Stanton, Virginia. And I said, how'd you know how to say Stanton? And he said, because I'm from Buena Vista. <laughs> so, and he said it, correctly, Buena Vista, um, or BV, and uh, <clears throat> the rest of the world, of course, says Buena Vista. So here's how that, the Buena Vista story, how, the, how Buena Vista got its name. Um, and I think in the advertisement I might have said, hey, here's the sign, if you go into Buena Vista, how many people have been to Buena Vista? <laughs> okay, if you haven't been there, you need to go there, it's a cute little town. Um, good barbecue place. They have a good barbecue yeah. place there. Yeah. They also have a Chinese it's restaurant. Called, it's called the Meat Mexican. Shack. It's called the Meat Shack. Yeah. A, yeah, you, yeah. Can get, you can get the Rock Bridge Burger. It's a burger and barbecue on the same boat. Yeah, you can get all kinds of meat there. It, it is, um, and milkshakes, <laughs> and it, it's, it's, it's nice. Um, I go there at least every six months because my dentist is in Buena Vista. Um, and uh, so... There are 6,600 people in Buena Vista now, so this sign could be updated. So. Yeah, they, but only three old grouches. Yeah. So, Buena Vista. Actually, Buena Vista's story goes back to the Mexican War, uh, which was the, the war that we never learn about because we skip right you know, from, we go Revolutionary War, oh yeah, War of 1812, uh, oh yeah, Mexican War, and then Civil War, and then, um, and then we talk about World War I and II, we kind of forget all this smaller wars. But the Mexican War was actually a pretty important war because it gave us an amount of territory um, bigger than the Louisiana Purchase. You know, 
all the way into California, Utah, New Mexico, Texas, all that. So 1846 to 48. Um, that, that territory acquisition has nothing to do with how Buena Vista got its name, though. But in, in um, the Mexican War, there was a big battle, the Battle of Buena Vista, on February 23rd, 1847. So I mentioned before that there was a lot of manganese and iron works um, in, the, in the western slopes of the Blue Ridge in Augusta, uh, Rock Bridge, Rockingham, Page County, Shenandoah County, the whole, the whole uh, length and, and breadth of the valley on the slopes uh, of the Blue Ridge. And so iron, there were iron works everywhere including one just outside of what today is, is the, the city of Buena Vista. This was a big one, and it was called the Buena Vista Iron, well, it was called the Iron Works, and, and they, they apparently supplied a lot of munitions. Um, I don't know if they went back as far as the War of 1812, but that's entirely possible, but they supplied a lot of the munitions, the cannonballs and things like that, um, in the Mexican War, and the munitions supplied from this Iron Works, and if you if you go um, on 608 today, you, if you go from Vesuvius, the town of Vesuvius, and you follow the South River, the South River that goes south. Um, not, to be, not to be confused with. Not to be confused with the, the South River that goes north through Waynesboro. Um, then you, it's a beautiful drive, um, and you'll eventually wind up at a crossroads where 608 takes a hard left. You'll see in front of you the... Mountain View, or Pleasant View, Mountain View? Mountain View Elementary School. Mountain uh, View Elementary School. Elementary School, yeah. Have you done a, a, a program there? Absolutely. I, I'm yeah. sure, a music program. Yeah. Richard goes to all the schools and does, does music programs, and he knows, all, he knows all the educators in Virginia and North Carolina from his music programs. Anyway, if you don't take that, that hard left, but you keep going, there's a little dead-end road and within 50 yards, you'll see the ruins that are just like that picture there, except for in ruins, uh, of that iron furnace. The iron furnace went out of business in the 1850s, but it was named, it was, it was dubbed the name Buena Vista for its, its role in the, the winning battle of Buena Vista. Um, we just put our, our valley accent on it. Um, so, so that, was out of business. There were other iron works around, um, but it was out of business long before the, the city of Buena Vista. So how did the city get its name? Well, because of the, all the iron works, you had all this uh, industry that was happening, iron works and manufacturing, um, really boomtown that has basic city sort of was, was birthed during this time period all along the river where you had water power and you had the materials for your manufacturing, like iron, um, these boom towns b were popping up. And so, so in the 1880s, there was a guy named uh, Benjamin Mumaw, and he had a farm called Green Forest Farm that was right along the, um, the South River, um, or the, I don't know if it was the south of the Mari, because they kind of joined. It's probably, at this point, it was the Mari River. Because the Mari River, uh, goes through Lexington and ends up in Buena Vista. And that south river that flows south pops into it just before you get to Buena Vista. So that makes it a, a bigger, stronger river. Um, the Mari River, by the way, used to be called the North River. Not the North River that goes north. North. But the North River the that North goes. The North River that goes east. Um, but, uh, but it was the northern And eventually northern south. Part of, yeah. yeah. And After they, it and, the, the and those river. formed the James River watershed. And the others form the, the Shenandoah watershed, which gets me to the name of Riverheads, um, where I went to high school and where Mr. Stout, um, you know, was the assistant principal. I was the band director. And, and Richard was the band director. And, and Mary, Mary Kate. The, at, at there. So Riverheads. Just go ahead and raise your hand. Did anybody go to Buena Vista? That's good. Thank you. Put Riverheads, your hands actually, that geographic area is the headwaters of the James River and the Shenandoah River. So that's why it's called Riverheads. And some of those Riverheads, those, those, the James River watershed is what goes into, 
into the Mari River, into the North River, and into the South River that goes south. And the, and the others go the other way. So it, it, the, the divide, in fact, the Mc, little village of McKinley uh, used to be called the Dividing Ridge because the waters on each side of the ridge go to the, the two rivers. But I digress. Um, right outside of what became Buena Vista, there was a farm. And Ms. Mr. Muma had his farm. It was called Green Forest Farm. And he was, a, he was also he was a farmer, and he was a brethren preacher. And uh, he kind of recognized that this was a place where industry was going to happen. You had two railroads coming through. You had a canal coming through. On the, the north, it was the North River Navigation Company, which was coming on the, on the Mari River. It was called the North River at that time. And you had all these iron works. You also had some tin works and, and uh, some tin, tin mining. And, and so you had all the resources right there. And he, so he felt like, so he got together with some investors and they, uh, um, they put together um, a prospectus. Um, it, the area was also called Hart's Bottom because it was the river bottom area where all this, when, where all this took place. And when you go from, if you get off the interstate at uh, um, you know, 81 South, you get off on Route 60. If you go, if you go west and turn right, um, you're going into Buena Vista. I mean, uh, you're going into Lexington. But if you turn left, you're on 60 and you, you wind up in Buena Vista. Right before you get into the city proper, you see this industry with these smokestacks and things kind of reflected in the, in the waters there. That's Hart's Bottom. And so these investors kind of got together and they said, well, we think, we think that this could, we've got something here, kind of like the basic city investors did. So they put together a prospectus. This was in 1888. They sold $400,000 worth of stock, which is a, a lot. That's a couple million dollars in today's money. And they, they sold it and, they, and they, planned out, they planned out a town, which is what you see right here. This is the perspective map of Buena Vista, Virginia. They sold that $400,000 stock in just, in just a few weeks. And so they, they planned out a town on 1,200 acres um, in 1888. They, had, they laid it out. And so how was it laid out, Richard? You got your uh, numbers and you got your, uh, your, your fruits in alphabetical order. It's like fruits pear and tree, street. Trees. Trees. Tree streets, yeah, like Maple Street. So the trees go that way and the numbers go that way. Yeah. And so, you know, like our friend, our mutual friend uh, lives on Walnut. Um, my cousins, my, my husband's cousins live on Orange Street. So, um, so that's how they laid it out. And, they, and, when, and when you're looking at this, you're looking, you're looking from the Lexington side, looking, that's the Blue Ridge Mountains behind you. Right. And the river goes from left to right. After it goes right, it's heading down to the James. Yeah, so this, this would basically, we were figuring this out. This 60 was coming in from here. So if you're coming from Lexington, you're coming around here and going this way toward the Blue Ridge Mountains. And if you go into to Buena Vista, the, mountain, the mountains behind it are just a beautiful backdrop of these, these craggy mountains right, right behind it. So, so they, so they um, sold out and they started playing in this town. Well, there was people who said we should call it Buena Vista after the old ironworks that were there. Other people said, I think we need to call it Green Forest. And there were other people who said we should call it Hart's Bottom. So the townspeople actually, the new townspeople had a vote. And on March 7th, 1889, the one that won the vote was Buena Vista. Um, by that time, it was, you know, we had put our, our accent on it, so it was, it was definitely Buena Vista. Um, and they chartered it as a city in, in 1892. And they started, I mean, they started laying out things right away. Um, and you can see in the middle there, that picture, that's, that's now Southern, Sem, Southern University, which was Southern Seminary, which started as a hotel. So, Can I ask you a question about sure. the map? Mm -hmm. Is the river flowing downstream from left to right here? That's flowing left to right because it's, it's going on. Is that right, Richard? Okay. Yeah, the right. Yeah. As you go right, you're heading toward the James River. Yeah, the yeah south. so the lower end is going on into the James River. It hits <clears throat> the James River. And the South River, not the one that flows south, is, is coming in right about to the left side of this picture. That's where it enters the okay. Maury River. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. So, uh, so immediately they stayed, they built a courthouse. They, they became, and they still are, an independent city. Um, they were chartered, and they never, never gave up their charter. So they have their own courthouse still today. They have their own school system. Um, and the, 
the top two pictures, that's the courthouse um, that is now, that's the old courthouse. They have a new courthouse now, but the old courthouse is now the, the public library. So the bottom picture, and that giant ant um, is actually there right now because there's an artist, kind of a free-spirited artist named Mark Klein who lives in Rockbridge, and he, he does... He does all these crazy well, that's things. That's an understatement. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he did foam hinge, <laughs> um, and he, he does, in fact, he's done several things in Waynesboro, surprise Halloween sculptures. and um, So one day, a couple years ago, the townspeople woke up, and there were giant insects all over the town. There was a praying mantis, and some a lot of them are still there. The ant is still there at the at the uh, library and there's a praying mantis up on top of one of the buildings. But anyway, that's, um, so they, they built, um, I've got it listed here, they built so many things so quickly. Um, in 1885, they built their first uh, school. That was just a little crude cabin. But in, in 1890, they built Perry McClure, or they built their, the, the um, Buena Vista School, um, which is a nice brick building. And the principal was a guy named Perry McClure and that he was such a beloved principal that the school became named for him. That school is now um, the middle school, and they've built a brand new high school. So the top one is the, the big brick school that they built in 1890 um, that was the school. When I went to Riverheads, that's the school that was Perry McClure High School that we played. It was a vicious rivalry in football. Um, but I always was kind of scared at Perry McClure because there's a big wall that goes around it still is around the, the middle school and I'm like if you gotta if you gotta close in the kids they must be pretty scary kids so um, and then the bottom the bottom picture is the current school and they've turned the the, the old school into the middle school um, let's see um, they built the first church in 1890 um, they built an opera house they had the big hotel I mean it was a hopping place Another significant thing for Buena Vista is that on January 17th, 1890, they formed a baseball team and they beat Lexington 28 to 15. Um, they established a very strong baseball tradition in Buena Vista. Tell us how that played out, Richard. Go ahead, Jim. You want it? Charlie Manuel was, he was the Phillies? Yeah, he, was, yeah, the he was the manager of the Phillies when they won the World Series. Yeah. Um, and so, so he um, went to Perry McClure High School. Yeah, so. went to Perry McClure High School. In fact, when you go into Buena Vista, there's a sign um, that that um, that's their one of their most famous people. So it was um it was a, a place of booming industry and still is it still does have a lot of of industry. It has a even has a school bus factory now. Which leads us back to water. Which leads us back to water. Right. Industry, industry is powered by water, and water giveth and water taketh away. Um, and the Buena Vista has always been subject to terrible, terrible flooding from that Mar the Mari River, where it's pumped up from getting the South River in it. And, um, and so Hurricane Camille was absolutely devastating. There's a famous picture, which I don't have here, of people pulling a, a rowboat through downtown Buena Vista. Um, so um, if you look at the picture on the right, it looks like just little puddles of water, but look at the cars piled on top of each other. That tells you a little bit what's happened. So uh, Hurricane Camille in, 18, uh, in 1969 was particularly devastating, and so was the 1985 flood. That if any of you were around here in 85, you remember that one too, Waynesboro. Waynesboro's the same way. You know, the, the river giveth and the river taketh away. Um, so here's some, some pictures from some of their floods. So what Buena Vista did is, well, let's go back. What Buena Vista did is uh, after the 1985 flood, which wiped out Goshen Pass, um, and so they said, we've got to do something about this. So they actually created a, a flood wall. They started talking about it and, you know, right after the 85 flood, and um, it was completed in 1997. It was uh, Jim Olin, if anyone remembers the congressman, um, from this area, he was the one that it's often called his flood wall. It's about a two mile flood wall. They have gates and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so far, it's, it's worked. You can even, they've even got a hiking trail around it now. And uh, the flood wall, you can see the flood wall if you go over to uh, Glen Murray Park. Here's just some of the, the, the big 
um, important places. To the right, that's Paxton Hall, and that actually is a, is a mid-19th century house. It's a historic house. The Historical Society of the Buena Vista area is housed there, and, um, and that predates, of course, um, the city of Buena Vista. Uh, it's, it's been nicely restored, and, it, and a lot of the, there's a lot of history that's been put together on Buena Vista. It has a fascinating history. And, of course, the Hotel Buena Vista became Southern Seminary, and then after that it became um, the, it's Southern, Southern Re College now that... Richard, Southern Virginia University. Southern Virginia, there you go. And Richard, I'm, the, I'm the tuba teacher there. There yeah, you go. Yeah. And, um, and what did you say? It's the only... It's a, it's a Mormon yeah, school. It's, yeah, east of the Mississippi River. Yeah, only you have, Mormon... You have to go to Hawaii to find another one. Yeah. All the way around past yeah. China, keep yeah. going. You or go. you can go to... to um, That's a yeah. cool... Anybody not seen that motel? Yeah. There's, now there's a giant, they're the Knights, they're the Southern Virginia Knights, there's this giant metal, I mean bigger than that grasshopper, much bigger, and metal knight in front of the building. So when I first called my tuba student that I had down there, she said, meet me at the night. I went, what are you talking about? Now you're walking, it's like as tall as this sign. <laughs> so well, didn't yeah. uh, Mr. Stout, did one of your daughters go there? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, she, she spent one year there. Yeah. So, um, and um, yeah, my, my dentist is Mormon and he... Um, they're very closely connected with the school. So, so um, that's, that's Buena Vista. Um, here's some of the other, on the right, that's uh, the First Presbyterian Church, which was not the first church in Buena Vista, but it was built shortly after the first church was built. And then the, the bird's eye view, I talked about the mountains that you see there. It really is a, it, it really is a, a beautiful setting. Um, I don't know much about the coffee. Do you know much about the coffee pot? It's, uh, it's on 60 right before you get in there. They used to have a, uh, an outfitters that ran out of there, like a canoe outfitters. That, um, I, I we'll, cl we'll clear the air one day, Mary, Mary Kay. We'll go down there and find We'll get the story. I think, this, I think in my cyclist guide to the Shenandoah Valley, I talk about it, but, you know, we published that in the 1980s, and it's a little, that was last century, yeah. The Chessie Trail, okay, look here. Uh, well, hey, stop, is, stop right there, Nancy. Okay, Richard wants to tell us. So this, this is my road story. So if you go into that, this is before you get to go in there. You go in there and take a right at Hardy's. You just go to Hardy's, take a right. If you've got your Garmin on and your th thing, so that's Highway, U.S. Highway 501. See where that sign is right there? So that's where it ends. The other place, John, where does, where does it end on the other end? You know? No, a 501. 501. 501 ends in, in Buena Vista. Myrtle Beach. So it goes to Myrtle Beach. So when you get on, when you're riding down the road on 60 and you take a right and get on 501 in Buena Vista, the name of the road is Beach Boulevard. I'm not kidding, man. That's, yeah. And if you're coming from, it used to be a sign in Myrtle Beach that said 501 Buena Vista. That was the real silly sign, but they finally got rid of that one. So you see this big green sign that said Buena Vista that way. Just a short drive. Just a short drive, yeah. So um, the Chessie Trail, someone was asking about that. That, that is a, a, a wonderful resource that's been restored um, through Rails to Trails. It, the Chessie Trail is a, is a bicycling and walking path that goes from Lexington to Buena Vista. And it originally, the, and it follows, follows the Mari River, and then the South River comes in as you get close to Buena Vista. That originally was a canal and it was, the, uh, it was the North River Navigation Company. And so the canal boats went, they came up the James River, it was the James River and Canal Canal, and they had a spur um, in, in Buena Vista that came into Lexington. Um, and, and so canal boats would come from Richmond all the way into Lexington, and if, you, if you're on Route 11 and you're heading to Lexington, you cross the Mari River at the big bridge there now, that used to be a covered bridge, but um, and then immediately turn right, and that's Jordan's Point Park, and that's that was the terminus of the canal, and there was a big a big basin, not a tidal basin, but a big ba water basin there where the boats would come in and turn around, and VMI, you can see that up on the hill, and um, and so it was it was a, the towpath, you know, you have to have the canal boats had were pulled by by mules, and so the towpath was what's now the CNO Canal. Well, that. Um, some floods in the 19th century wiped out the, the canal company. Um, and, and then the river changed to the Mari River. 
but the railroad just picked up right on top of that towpath, and it was the Chessie Railroad. It was a spur of the of the CNO, and it went, you know, from from Lexington to Buena Vista, and this the spur of the railroad. And then it connected into the major that made main line um, in in Buena Vista, but the spur just followed the same thing. So it, then it became a railroad path, and then they. Um, I want to say Camille maybe wiped out that the railroad spur, um, and so it just became a nature trail. And um, VMI kind of ran it sort of a little bit, and finally, a friends of the the Chessie Trail, it was called the Chessie Trail, kind of took it over and worked with VMI, and they've they've turned it into a, just a, a, a really a gem of a, a recreational trail. They've now <clears throat> now you can bicycle on it, and they have these. It, it, a lot of it goes through private land, so they have the, they've created these gates that you don't have to get off your bicycle. You just bump the gate, and the gate opens, and you can kind of put your feet on the ground and walk your bike through the gates. Um, and it go and you can see remnants of the old canal locks and the and remnants of the railroad um, as you go. And a lot of you know it's all reverted back to nature. At one point, you go through a um, a farmer's field where there are cattle standing. Um, all along the road, so you got to watch out for the cow pies. But it's a really beautiful little ride. There has been for years and years and years since the '85 flood, where the South River comes in, that bridge got wiped out, and so you had to. Um, and I just I rode it a couple times this past year. You have to get out on the road for about a half a mile, and then get back on the trail. Well, um, this past year, VMI put in for a, a big. Uh, grant and got it, and they're rebuilding that bridge. So by this su coming summer, you're going to be able to go on the whole path, and you don't have to get out on the road anymore. Seven miles. It's seven miles one way. So if you go up and back, you got a 14-mile ride. Um, it's a great little, great little path. So um, let's see. One other little bit of trivia, and we'll end with that, and then answer any questions. Um, there's not a historic marker for this yet, but I have an interesting tie to to Buena Vista. Um, back when, so that's that. In case you didn't recognize me, that's me and my husband. Um, so um, back in 1980, uh, my husband had just gotten out of the army. We dated. We started dating in high school. Mr. Stout might remember that. Um, we started dating in high school. We dated all through Riverheads High School, and then, um, and then I went to college, and he went in the Army, and he got out of the Army my senior year of college, and I was playing volleyball at Bridgewater, and we had a, we had a game um, in Roanoke. And so I'd come home on Friday night and with the idea that I was going to meet the team as they were heading south from Bridgewater, meet them at the Buena Vista exit, and um, and go on to get get on the van and go on to Roanoke, and then my husband was my future husband. Um, that I didn't know this yet, but my future husband was going to go down and see the game, and then he was going to um, drive me back home. So he kind of got us there early at the little pull off. If you get off of uh, the exit, there's a little pull off there as you're heading toward Buena Vista. Just a little side kind of park and ride area but um, and we were waiting and it was early and he got us there early because he popped the question to me there that's where I became engaged right there and then um, not long after he popped the question the van pulls up and I jumped on the van with my new diamond ring and um, it was quite the exciting thing for all the players on the van um, and then so that's so nobody knows that story now except for you and someday you can put a historic marker there if you want but <laughs> Did you wear the ring during the game? That's a. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't think so, though. I don't think we were allowed to wear things like that that would, you know, that could cause damage to people. That wasn't a very big diamond, so it probably couldn't have caused a lot. Of Is damage. that the Episcopal Church right there where you're kneeling? Yeah, that's Emmanuel Episcopal in in, in Stanton where we got married. Okay. The uh, the picture on your left is um, Riverhead's high school prom, so. So it's a, it's a regrettable fashion period, I know. I don't think you, I, I didn't think he wore that to ask the question. So. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's prom, yes. So any questions? Trivia points?
Let's go back away from this picture. It's a little embarrassing. So go to the Chessie Trail. That's prettier. Uh, any other questions? No questions? Got any trivia for us? Can you tell us some stories about Nancy in high school, Jim? Well, I could, I could start on that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nancy was I was actually a very good athlete. I remember that. And uh, it was during that era that we, uh, uh, they had stopped when they consolidated the schools for Cruz Strap and uh, Riverhead and Buffalo Gap and Ford and, and Grove Hopkins and all of the schools. And uh, they dropped. We played Natural Bridge, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. I knew we were playing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, uh, uh, from that grew basketball, and then we started back uh, with girls track. And, and uh, uh, one of the most satisfying things that I had during my time in Chester County was the growth of girls' athletics. We had as many of uh, the girls' teams and so forth. May I tell one story on Richard? Absolutely. Yeah, I want, I want to hear it. That's only, that's only <laughs> fair. Um, there was a very talented uh, social studies teacher named Max Swift, and a very talented individual, and uh, uh, he, he played several musical instruments and sang, and him and his wife were really nice people. But anyway, Max was the football coach at Riverhead for a while, and uh, Yeah, you're, yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> the bass drum play. That's yeah, right. I'll, I'll stop with that. Yeah, yeah. Can I tell a Riverhead story about Richard? Sure. Sure, Mary Kay. <laughs>
He's down in North Carolina, um, near Marion, North Carolina. What's he doing? Is he retired already? No, he'd like to retire. He, he, he works for a, um, in management of a, a company that makes um, these high-tech um, brakes for automobiles. It's, it's down there. His, um, let's see, his youngest daughter's getting ready to, she's a senior at UNC, she's getting ready to graduate with a biochemistry degree. His middle daughter is, is stationed out in San Diego. She went to the Naval Academy. And his oldest daughter graduated from uh, App State and, uh, and, and is, wants to be a, a physician's assistant. So she's working toward that. That's right. Yep, she taught at Verona Elementary and Riverheads Elementary. Well, thank you for coming out. And uh, if, if you go on the web, if you look up uh, on uh, Facebook on footnotes in Valley History, we've got about fourteen of these. So, yep. so they last anywhere from twenty minutes to an hour. If so. anybody thinks we should, you know, do series, the second season series. Let us know. We'll take sponsorships. It's pretty, uh, pretty inexpensive to be a sponsor. Something like twenty-five dollars a show, or one hundred and twenty-five for all of them, or something like that. So just let us know, uh, and with ideas of what we should talk about too. Thank you. No, um, but you know, my my friend and I who just retired from teaching since.